Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our Tuesday afternoon MPA webinar series um, featuring a few fantastic speakers from our 2019 IMAG conference that was held back in May. Um, I'm Marissa Levy, and I'm the Marketing and Events Manager here at MPA. Hopefully, you all can hear me okay. Um, we're going to be hosting a few different webinars throughout the summer, and this week we're focusing on brand extensions and how indie brands are finding creative and effective ways to grow and tap into new revenue resources. Um, so we brought in a few experts today to explain more about this topic, and I'd like to introduce you to them. Um, so our first speaker, Kate Weeks, is the marketing director at Yankee Magazine, and she'll be discussing Yankee's television series, Weekends with Yankee, which has reached over 1 million viewers per episode on PBS. Um, the series is a true multi-platform effort and is successfully driving subscriptions to the magazine. Um, next up, we'll have Brene Jordan, who is the SVP and group publisher at Taunton Press, and she'll talk about the company's many brand extensions, including podcast networks, events such as Fine Woodworking Live, and TV series including Classic Woodworking. And then we'll finish up with Gary Michelson, who's the Vice President of Consumer Marketing and Operations at Garden and Gun, and he is going to share how the magazine speaks to the soul of the South beyond the printed magazine. Um, so, just a few reminders before we get started with Kate. Um, all the attendees are on mute right now, so um, if you have a question, just type it into the question box on the control panel on your screen, um, and then we'll, we'll answer them verbally after each presentation. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kate to get us started. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Weeks, Marketing Director and Head of Business Development for Yankee Magazine, and I'm going to be sharing more information about our Weekends with Yankee brand extension. We created our TV series in 2015 as a co-production with public media producer WGBH Boston as a new TV platform dedicated to New England travel, lifestyle, food, and personalities. The series tagline, An Insider's Guide to New England from the People Who Know It Best, speaks to what our goal was with the series from the very beginning and what we hope to offer a viewer, whether they were tuning in from Maine or Minneapolis. You'll see on the bottom of this slide, some of the additional places and platforms where viewers can find the series, including Amazon, iTunes, and on-demand services, in addition to its primary home on public television. Also pictured here are series co-hosts, Amy Traverso, Amy also serves as Yankee Senior Food Editor and helps to connect the series with Yankee Magazine. And our co-host, Richard Weiss, a national Emmy Award-winning travel host and president of the Explorers Club. Richard is based in New England, but he can also channel the questions a viewer at home might have. In slide two, you'll see a snapshot of our By the Numbers data about the series. In addition to audience development, getting our brand out there in new ways was one of our primary goals in creating the series and really helping to solidify Yankee as a national media brand helped us to create new conversations to have with advertisers, both existing advertisers and new prospects. You'll see here a snapshot of the reach of the series and the desirable and affluent and educated PBS audience. Moving along to slide three. When we were creating the series, we started by thinking of it as a spoke off the Yankee brand wheel, and it really has become a whole new wheel for us. I'll walk you through some of the extensions of our brand extension and the ways it has helped Yankee across PR, sales, creating new subscribers, and creating additional benefits for our core audience and core readership. Starting on the left side, I'll walk you through some of the spokes. Our premium membership program, the series archive of episodes, we're now in um, pre-production for season four and season three is currently airing on PBS stations across the country. But the series archive of episodes is available as a benefit for the premium membership level on our website. Media partners, the series is supported by a national PR campaign including a regular relationship with the Hallmark Channel, helping to solidify Weekends with Yankee and our talent as truly national experts. Weekendswithyankee.com. 
a multi-platform experience for audience and sponsors. Our series digital extensions, including weekendswithyankee.com, are places where viewers can, can log on for it travel itineraries and recipes from the series and new series editorial. Fans of the series will also find new editorial in every issue of Yankee Magazine to create not only a richer experience for our audience, but a multi-platform buy for advertisers. Their sponsorship messages are seen across digital, print, and broadcast. Moving over on the right side of the brand wheel, custom video and webisodes. Yankee Publishing has always had a custom publishing business but our work on the series has given us a new area of expertise as storytellers. We have now worked with a variety of clients on custom video projects, retail event and activations. We have hosted a variety of VIP dinners with talent and sponsors, brought our experts to food and wine events, and just created new ways for both sponsors and the public to access and engage with our talent. Driving subscription sales. Every episode of Weekends with Yankee that airs features a subscription offer and a dedicated 1-800 number, giving us an amazing new kind of PR channel to promote, um, to promote subscri subscriptions to the magazine. And lastly, one of the questions that you get asked most often with a, with a series of any kind is where can I find it? And we have worked to help answer that question um, you know, both on the, um, for the primary public television series, um, people can log on to weekendswithyankee.com and access our station finder um, where they can, you know, punch in their local zip, zip code and be matched with this, the public television station in their market. This series is also on a variety of new platforms, including Amazon, iTunes, and on-demand services. And now for questions. Someone talk about the PBS demographics? Demographics, your core user? So what are the demographics? Question. Um, is the subscriber coming to Yankee from this extension similar in demographics to your core user? I would say largely, largely yes. There is a significant amount of audience overlap, um, but it's also been a great vehicle to reach a new audience. You've got another one. Um, are you contemplating any further extensions along this line? Um, we are. We're looking to um, develop a podcast. That's certainly um, a platform that you know is a really rich opportunity for um, for storytellers. Um, so that's something that we're looking to develop. Um, we're also looking at developing um, an SIP. Um, to really be a nice print companion for the series. Okay, um, I think we're going to move on unless anyone else has any more questions. Um, so thank you, Kate, for sharing your story with us. Um, we're now going to turn it over to Renee, um, and she is going to share some a story from Talkin' Press, so here we go. Thank you, Marissa. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. Nice job, Kate. One second, just trying to get this into show mode. Well, one second. I'm not. My toggle switch is not working at the moment. Uh, 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 uh. 
Let's go to slideshow on the top on the top tab. There it is. From the beginning. Thank you. I'm used to hitting the F5 button. It wasn't working. I apologize. So, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Renee Jordan, as uh, Marissa introduced earlier, group publisher at Taunton Press. I've been here uh, a little over three and a half years. Um, a little bit about the Taunton Press. Um, it was founded in 1975 by Paul Roman, and Paul was an engineer and a frustrated woodworker who had essentially no place to turn for recurring high-quality information that would help him solve his woodworking challenges. And there was, at that time, before the internet, no bounty of uh, sources to find design inspiration for his woodworking and furniture projects. And very importantly, there was no efficient way to access and manage, um, engage with the community of fellow passionate woodworkers who were defining craft in the wood shops across uh, the country, actually the world. So the magazine launch was a perfect product and a perfect business model for this solution. And the company, after launching Fine Woodworking, also extended its brand uh, or its magazine product line into home building and cooking and gardening and sewing, a lot of the home inspiration markets. And the brand extensions for the next three decades were really focused around what they were comfortable with in the print space, um, expanding high quality information in the book channel and accessing the adjacent uh, distribution channels of newsstand and bookstores. So when we were uh, getting together, Kate, Gary, and I, to prepare for this uh, presentation at IMAG last month, I was I was struck by the uh, ages of the different brands that we represent here. I mean, first, your host, MPA, is 100 years old this year. Happy birthday. Um, and that same year, 100 years ago, Conrad Hilton launched his hotel chain, so I was like, ah, look at what Hilton has become over the last hundred years in terms of uh, high scale uh, hotel chains, gone upscale, downscale, and essentially every sleep number in between. Um, in 1935, Yankee Magazine was launched. You just heard from Kate and how she and the team there have built over on eight decades of brand equity with Yankee to expand it beyond just their regional corner of the world and go way beyond the print digest starting point of that company. Um, Gary, who you'll hear from after I finish up uh, at Garden and Gun. Garden and Gun was launched in 2007, essentially the same year as the iPhone launch. And we all know about the prowess in, of product development at Apple. And I think of Garden and Gun really as a digital native brand um, almost innovating and expanding their brand and their product line from birth, not waiting a couple of decades to get there. So what lessons can we take from this kind of history lesson? Um, first, there's a choices and opportunities really have two paths when you're looking at expanding your brand or expanding your products. You know, first, the first decision point is around the business model, whether you're looking to leverage your capabilities for driving consumer revenue through subscriptions or e-commerce or product sales, any, any other continuity programs on digital platforms, or the second revenue stream or category of revenue stream around uh, B2B or advertising and client relationships. Another path of, con of uh, consideration for brand and product extensions is around brand goals. Um, not all products are necessarily tied to revenue. You can articulate the value of what you want to accomplish with product and brand extensions by driving different goals with your brand, awareness, engagement, or, or funnel activation, or in the case of Yankee and of, uh, in the case of fine cooking, as you see here on the screen, uh, scale to reach a much larger audience. Fine cooking, we, with um, we also co-produce a television show with WGBH in Boston, similar to Yankee, and Movable Feast with Fine Cooking is now in its seventh season. Um, this brand extension ad addresses the issues of scale in this really crowded marketplace and has driven considerable advertising and partnership revenue through underwriting and other, other uh, arrangements between our brands. We experience all of the things you just learned about, the similar business model expansions um, that Yankee is doing. And this program has enabled us to tap much larger scale uh, advertising budgets 
and create robust uh, multi-platform campaigns that neither uh, WGBH nor Taunton could do in isolation. And we've traveled the world. The, uh, the team just wrapped up filming season seven in Spain, Portugal, and England. Um, while this program is, con is a content-rich experience, and it's, it's really about local ingredients and local chefs that come together to create uh, a memorable feast at the end of the, of the episode, we at Taunton have, have, have to view this as decidedly an ad product. It is managed as such around our costs and our development and planning and execution. It's all centered around our marketers, our clients, and their goals, and our underwriters' goals, their performance, and their ROI. And while we focus on that, our partner, in this case WGBH, they use their expertise in television production and distribution to deliver uh, viewer engagement and reach. Another way to think about brand extensions is, is, it, is this kind of maybe hard to see, but a very important uh, product development uh, framework. And it really takes product development or an agile mindset to bring successful extensions and new products to market. This is an example for the woodworking market and specific uh, to fine woodworking. Um, it starts in the upper left-hand corner around uh, what, do, what is your existing products and what audiences do you serve? And then come the extensions, either extended products to the right or extended markets and, and customers and uh, distribution channels down the side. This is really a three or four dimensional thing uh, set in a two dimensional flat view. And the closer you stay to your center and expand linearly up and down, um, that's where your most success comes from and, and your least amount of risk. And I'll give you more uh, examples of how this works in the case study for fine woodworking, which is on this slide. Um, the brand, of course, started as a magazine product, first and foremost, and subscriptions were the business model driver. Again, going back to the business model choice, it was very important that we focused on the quality content and packaging throughout the life of this brand. Yes, there's advertising, but it is a secondary consideration in the business model driver. In the 90s, uh, the brand Fine Woodwork came online into its digital presence, um, but it was also focused on its consumer fee revenue. Um, we, the digital experience at the time, a lot of people were chasing uh, advertising in the uh, growth of the digital advertising piece, but it was very important for fine woodworking to stay premium to the consumer. So most of the content was gated uh, behind a paywall, even early on in the discussions of paywall. The podcast for fine woodworking launched um, seven years ago, early on in uh, podcast popularity, and to date has received 3.7 million uh, downloads. It has been its own product extension uh, story arc, much like what Kate was saying about how Yankee Weekends with Yankees, its own brand with its own extension. The same thing happened for the podcast. When it was first launched, uh, the intent was about brand building, and particularly a, among a younger demo. We find that our podcast listeners are 10 to 15 years younger than our even digital uh, and uh, website audiences. It's now evolved to a brand promotion channel for other paid products and services. Uh, for example, when we launched our event business uh, a few years ago, a third of the attendees reported that they first heard about the event on the podcast. So now our podcast process is about touting our own product extensions and um, execution of other products. In the third iteration of our podcast, it's now evolved into a very engaging and effective advertising product. All five of the Taunton brands now have podcasts, and a number of them in the ad-driven markets are sold out pretty much for the rest of the year. It's a, a very high-demand format, uh, and so it's become the, tri the trio of effectiveness in a product extension and a product launch. In the event business, Fine Woodworking started about three years ago. There was an experiment about five years ago, but we really pushed it together and brought it to market. Uh, in 2016, 
The revenue model, again, was a decision around the consumer fee, and that's a, an important decision to make when you're doing events. They can either be advertising or partnership-driven or consumer fee-driven, and it's important to, to make the distinction because it dictates the experience and the investment in what you uh, decide to bring to market. This was a place also that we felt we could extract more revenue per consumer, a product with a higher perceived value than what is expected for a typical magazine subscription or uh, a digital membership even. Uh, this, this event started with one annual event in the same location and the same uh, weekend in April. We've done the annual event now three times and it too are going down its own product and brand extension. We have regional uh, stagings in smaller markets at even higher price points. So this is a place you can get five, seven to seven hundred to a thousand dollars from your most ardent um, participants in your business and you keep that experience at a high engaged level. And as Marissa mentioned at the outset of our uh, webinar, we uh, find woodworking also entered a TV partnership with WGBH for a woodworking show um, about a year and a half ago. And if you remember what I said about movable feast and its focus as an ad product, in this case, it was a different uh, experience for us because the hobby woodworking market is highly specific and highly endemic with marketing partners. And our experience so far has been that, that the scale play that we enjoy with, with fine cooking and movable feast, it's not as relevant for our partners in the woodworking market to achieve their goals. There's not a lot of non-endemic large-scale advertising budgets that would want to tap this platform and this target audience. So we're still working, again, around our uh, next iteration, but at a cautious level and uh, minimizing risk associated with uh, the cost of TV production. And finally, the uh, on this case study for fine woodworking, the digital membership program that we reinvented last year, it really brings full circle kind of this product development and brand extension uh, conversation. Uh, we changed our go-to-market strategy for how we sell both the magazine and the paywall into a bundled subscription offer that included print, digital access, and the digital archive. Prior to this, they were all separate offerings brought a lot of confusing in the market. You could subscribe to the magazine but not get the digital archive. They were all marketed separately and differently. And we added benefits to what it meant to become a member and adding our um, top selling book content, again going into the other parts of our business to, to leverage content that we already had to sell to existing and new, new uh, prospects. And we raise price across the board. So it's a bundled offer at a higher price point than what you would even get if you bought them individually. And it was one of these cases where increased price generated increased demand, which was something I'd never seen. Because um, it sums up, you know, the kind of the part of the story. We focused our revenue model on the consumer fee. We asked what enhanced products could we bring to our existing customers? What existing products could we bring to extended audience? This is, in this case, this change in the go-to-market strategy and this enabled us to actually go into pros digital streams to prospect where we could not do that before. Um, when you have a digital uh, paywall membership, it loses context unless you're in the environment of on the website and under understand what the benefits are. But bringing the, the bundle and the unlimited package together we're now able to effectively market in our prospect digital streams. And together, these are winning, allowing us to uh, grow prospects and sales there. With our existing customers, this enhanced benefits also delivered a response performance that at the higher price, and we did not see the fall off in demand or deterioration of our retention. So what Paul um, Roman envisioned 40 years ago uh, continues to live. It's the tribes of woodworkers have this recurring fresh source of information, inspiration, a deep evergreen archive made possible by the print publishing production cycles over the past four decades. All of this searchable, image-filled content um, with videos that is accessible now on a cloud somewhere or on a piece of hardware that's about the size of your thumb. And we feel we still have opportunity, even given our print-only beginnings, to continue to expand our product line, our distribution channels, and our audience reach. 
with, of course, our ability to grow revenue and profits. So that's the fine woodworking story. Uh, looks like there's some questions coming up. Marissa, can you help me with those? Wow. Sorry about that. Um, given the strong advertiser tie-in, do marketers come to you with content ideas or do you generate them in-house? Uh, both. Um, a lot of um, first thing you want to do when you're when the marketers is listen to what their goals are. If you know if it's you know heads in the beds or, or butts in the seats at an event or uh, address a new uh, audience or change perception perceptions among a certain audience group. So you listen to what their goals are and then you create and iterate on how you leverage what qual you know what what capabilities you have your storytelling capabilities and uh, and integrate that way. Okay, and do, you, do your computers have similar extensions? Do you, I'm going through the list in my head. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm going through, I think the, particularly in the woodworking market, because it's a very tight and uh, passionate community, so there are other shows, other, other podcasts, um, it's each of us do it at a different iteration and a different level of uh, premium and different level of consumer engagement. Um, in the uh, home building market, not so much. Pretty unique in our product extension offerings. They're very similar to what you see in Find Wood Working here. Um, let's see. Do any of the Taunton brands publish books? Oh, yes. That's what we do. That that uh, the the Taunton Press is known actually for its quality book publishing program in woodworking, in home remodeling and construction, in gardening and cooking, and sewing. We pretty much uh, use the uh, the product, the market platforms to to launch uh, books in our with our imprint. And we continue to do that. Great. Um, we'll do a couple more and then we'll switch over to Gary. Um, of the five case study categories, which platform was most successful? So when you say place, um, I, I guess the, uh, the questioner can't uh, follow my question. Um, if he's asking about whether it's digital membership, podcast, events, TV show, I would at the end put it everything back to the digital membership and the launch of the product of uh, for engagement because that's got a long tail, a growth path record to uh, uh, in scale in our consumers. Yes, we added money and good chunks of money in our advertising delivery for uh, for the TV partnership. We did very and are doing very nice little chunks of uh, income for our event business. But it's really leveraging the scale of your audience in a digital membership ecosystem that is most successful for us. Great. Um, what is fine water fine woodworking doing to appeal to women? So, uh, we use our event business actually to expand into demographics and to showcase uh, our brand beyond um, what is thought of as you know the male dominated core. So at our event in April of this year, we had eight present uh, speakers, eight presenters of, you know, really rock star status of pr practitioners in the in the field and four of them uh, are women. And actually our top rated class at that course was run by a woman and it, it was uh, and we used social media in our Instagram handle and feeds to showcase uh, uh, women makers and uh, and uh, really all work workers. So it's it's opening up the brand to be to be uh, inclusive of all uh, of those who aspire to be fine woodworkers, so male or female. But thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, and just one more question: Any area you are exploring to add to your current array of platforms? Um, I would say what I'm most interested in exploring, don't have a plan for it, is over the top distribution of our video content. You know, the getting into the 
um, hands of people who are consuming content through video content, long form video content, short form through um, over the top distribution apps. All right, um, great. Thank you so much, Renee, for sharing your presentation and answering those questions. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, Gary. Um, and Great. Thank you, Marissa. And uh, thanks, Renee and uh, Kate. Uh, as was the case last month when we all presented together at the IMAG conference, you once again leave me tough acts to follow. In fact, I will do my best. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. As Marissa had mentioned, I'm Gary Michelson. I'm the Vice President of Consumer Marketing and Operations with Garden and Gun. I've had the good fortune of being with the magazine for all 12 years since we launched. I've certainly seen it grow and change over the years. Um, before I start, just for those who may not be familiar with Garden and Gun, I'll just give you the kind of the one minute overview. Um, we're a high-end Southern lifestyle magazine, um, not really about gardening nor guns. Uh, the title tends to be metaphorical, um, representing a love and respect for the land and enthusiasm for the active sporting uh, lifestyle. Um, editorially, we cover travel and food and drink, art, culture, music, uh, and also a variety of profiles and stories on people and events that are relevant to the South. Uh, our print circulation um, is 400,000, and while we are a Southern lifestyle magazine, uh, only 70% of our readership is in the Southeast, and um, the other 30% is outside. So we're really a, a, a national brand. Um, we tend to appeal to a very affluent audience, and our readers tend to be quite passionate towards our brand, which is one of the things that's led us into a number of our um, brand extensions. Uh, for some reason, all of a sudden, it's not forwarding here. Oh, there we go. Um, the one thing about us, though, is we are a single title publisher, and uh, we only come out six times a year. So we need to be continually looking for ways to engage and interact with our audience and also um, develop, you know, incremental and, and new revenue streams. And we certainly are doing a lot of things. Uh, I'm not going to touch on every one of my presentation today, but I want to talk a few quickly as we look at the wheel here of some of the things I'm not going to expand on. Um, in the digital space, we have a lot of things that we're doing. We have, obviously, a digital edition. Um, we are continually posting original content on our website and social media. Uh, we have two e-newsletters with over 150,000 subscribers. Um, we do over 60 events a year. Uh, these are predominantly uh, sponsored events. Um, we've produced, uh, to date, three uh, newsstand-only specials. Uh, we also have developed a uh, website that helps um, high-end properties um, market themselves. Um, but what I'm going to focus on in the next few minutes are really more those brand extensions that are um, consumer uh, transactional. Uh, first is our books. Um, an absolute natural for us with all the you know wealth of content that we have. Um, to date, we've published four that are pictured here. Um, we have a fifth book coming out this fall. Um, it's going to be feature. The feature is on Southern women. And as you can probably, I hope you can appreciate from this picture of the four books here, um, all are designed really to be keepsakes or coffee table items. A lot of um, effort and expense goes into the design and the actual production of the, of the books uh, and, the, and the look and feel of them. Um, they range in price anywhere from $25.99 up to $45. And um, the one thing about all of our books is the content is evergreen, uh, meaning it stays relevant forever. There's nothing that we're writing here that would really age out. Um, so the nice thing about that is even our oldest books, which are now four and five years old, 
we continue to enjoy very brisk sales. And um, this book business has now, in addition to the new books that come out, and you know we have the advance, et cetera, but our book business now has been a, a nice ongoing means of uh, royalty payments, and we continue to see that. And when we promote it, um, you know, within our own magazine or around the holidays, we always con- see continued spikes. So this is an ongoing business that we expect is going to grow in the future. And as you can see from the slide here, to date, we've already sold over 300,000 books. Product licensing, um, this is actually a new area for us. Um, So I don't have any anecdotal information to share in terms of how sales have gone so far. Obviously that we're getting into it, our expectations that it's gonna be a good business for us. But we're working with a company, Clarkson Potter, um, and our first product is actually coming out in the spring of 2020. It's actually gonna be a game, it's a card game, but it's on Southern Trivia. Um, and when we reviewed this opportunity to get into product licensing, it just it made a lot of sense. It was it was very low risk. We know we have uh, a, a set audience that are passionate uh, and, and loyal to the Garden and Gun brand. Um, I mean, certainly with product licensing, there's always a risk. You, you're very protective that your brand is going to be represented properly. But um, if you're not familiar with Clarkson Potter, I mean, they're a huge company, extremely reputable tons of experience in this space and we had a very high degree of comfort with them they they understand our brand and um, we'll certainly you know we, we feel we'll do the right thing to protect it and also we have final approval on um, on any products or anything that comes out so our expectation is that this you know like our book business is going to be a nice ongoing incremental revenue stream into the future retail and e-commerce. Um, really, the e-commerce piece of this business, the ggfieldshop.com, makes up the lion's share of our volume. But we do actually have two brick-and-mortar locations. Um, they're actually both located in the lobby of the Dewberry Hotel in Charleston. Um, if you've never been to Charleston, I can say the Dewberry is a wonderful property. Uh, it's a very high-end space that caters to the same uh, demographics of our audience. Um, Also, having this location in Charleston, which is our home base, really uh, gives us a nice opportunity to do pop-up sales um, if we want to feature a specific product category, or sometimes we'll have a designer uh, come in and actually have a sale that day. So it gives us a way to have a a little bit of a mini event right in our own backyard, and they've proved to be uh, actually quite popular. The one thing um, I will say about um, e-commerce or retail, if if any of you are not in this space or haven't experienced it, um, it's very important, or we learned this lesson, very important and not to try to be all things to all people. Um, And you really need to manage your SKUs. Uh, In this this world, in this business, uh, if you're not one of the giants, I mean, the inventory uh, can can quickly get out of hand. Uh, space and carrying costs can bury you. So we found it's very important for us to remain a boutique site that caters to the sensibilities of the garden and gun audience. And actually what was somewhat surprising to us is we found that a large percentage of the field shop customers were not actually garden and gun subscribers. But when we did the analysis, they are very similar in terms of the demographics as far as age, um, education, income, um, and, and their interests. Corporate gifts. This is kind of an interesting area that we developed or started or got into a couple of years ago. And it actually grew out of our subscription business. Now, we've always had a really robust gift subscription business from the very beginning. And we have you know, concerted efforts, direct mail, online efforts that are geared towards driving individual gift subscriptions. But what we found over the years is that we were getting unsolicited calls from companies that were buying gift subscriptions for their clients and vendors, and we were getting orders anywhere from 20 to several hundred at a time. And so, I mean, literally, we were generating thousands of corporate gift subscriptions a year. So we created a position um, a couple of years back to actually you know, proactively solicit this business. But when we looked at the position, 
we felt it, it didn't make sense to not offer a more robust product offering, um, considering we had uh, you know, inventory and packaging capabilities within our e-commerce business. So um, as you can see pictured here, we create these customized curated gift sets around a variety of themes based on the products that we have in our inventory. And um, these really have become quite a popular item amongst the corporate gift clients. And while we don't actually manufacture anything, our ability to source these products, to find unique, high quality specialty items and package them in a way that's 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 very classy um has really become a nice appealing option um for our for our gift clients the last the garden and gun club um this is not a membership uh this is actually a physical bar restaurant located in the area uh, known as the battery which is outside the SunTrust Park in Atlanta where the Braves play. And um, this is actually, it's pictured here. This is the actual club, the in, in exterior and interior shots. Uh, menu is, and the decor are designed around what I put, this is being quotes, the garden and gun lifestyle. Um, one thing that's interesting about the garden and gun or the brand is we've actually in some ways become an adjective. If if people, for example, attend one of our events or they come visit our office, um, a lot of times what they'll say is this feels very garden and gun. Um, you know, it's it's obviously high quality. It has a certain sensibility, um, you know, upscale. And as you can see, we tried to bring that to life in the decor as well as the menu offerings um, um, at the club. Um, now, it wasn't a slam dunk for us. I mean, we weren't actually looking at initially to open a club, but when the opportunity presented itself and we looked at everything, it, it, it just made a lot of sense. I mean, first of all, the foot traffic is obviously very good, um, but we found we've been open a little over a year now. And um, even on non game days or in the off season, we've, we're, we're a destination. So while certainly the foot traffic on game day helps, um, we've enjoyed very uh, brisk uh, business throughout the year again because Garden and Gun, you know, again, the club has become a destination for people. And, um, you know, why Atlanta as opposed to Charleston? Charleston's our home base, it's our backyard. Certainly there's a wealth of, you know, food, restaurants in Charleston. Um, but Atlanta made sense. I mean, number one, obviously the proximity to SunTrust Park uh, and that, you know, the, the, the traffic it drives. But also, um, Atlanta happens to be our largest market in terms of readership by far, um, and it's an affluent area, and um, it really uh, was probably, the, like I said, the best place that made the most sense for us uh, because of the built-in audience. So as you can see, we have a lot, um, a lot of things going on, um, and be happy to field any questions. Thank you, Gary. Um, it looks like you've got a couple questions. The first one, you mentioned that you need to carefully control your garden and gun sensibility and style. Is that a full staff effort or is there a central person or team who masterminds the wonderful style and sensibility? Um, is that related to the, the product offering? Are you talking about e-commerce? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it is because that's when I had mentioned being true to our sensibility. Um, th that's a, it's a good question. Um, we are very cautious. I mean, there's a, uh, obviously we want to buy products that um, are, you know, going to read our, you know, that are be you know, saleable and have profitability. Um, so a lot of times we will source products that um, we have covered in the magazine. Uh, or that we've uncovered through our Made in the South awards, uh, because we, you know, part of one of the editorial features in the magazine is looking for new and unique products uh, sourced through Southern artisans. Uh, it gives us almost a built-in network of, um, you know, reaching new uh, and, and, and high-quality products that we know will appeal to our customers. Thank you. Um, another question, do you ever collaborate with well-known Southern celebrities on programs? Um, we we do. I mean, a lot of times, um, you know, we, we frequently will do things with executive chefs. 
Um, there are certainly a lot of the Southern writers and authors, uh, you know, work closely with us. Um, musicians, we have uh, very uh, strong relationships within the music community. Um, not so much, I wouldn't say we're as big in collaboration with quote unquote Hollywood celebrities, but in the, in the areas of food, uh, you know, literary celebrities, music, uh, yes, uh, we actually, you know, work closely with a lot of people that, um, you know, participate in some of the garden and gun events or, again, oftentimes they're judges for some of our competition uh, and or they're contributing writers to the magazine. And any plans for a TV show? Um, I I guess anything is possible. Um, you know, getting into the area of TV is 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 complex. Um, I can't say that at this moment it is something that's on our short list. But I think if the opportunity presented itself, I do personally believe that our content would uh, translate very well uh, to t some types of specials. Uh, but at the moment, uh, no, we have uh, there is no short term plan for that. And then similar to that, are you developing any podcasts? Um, we do. We actually have uh, a number of podcasts that have been produced. Um, currently, that program is um, on hiatus. But yes, if you if you it's actually if you want to download and review it, it's called the Whole Hog. And I believe I don't know exactly at the top of my head how many we've produced to date. Um, but yes, they, they exist and we're actually quite popular. Great. We'll have to look into that. Um, Okay, so if anyone has any more questions, feel free to ask for either Gary, Renee, or Kate. Um, and if not, then we will say goodbye. <laughs> So I just want to thank, again, um, Kate, Renee, and Gary for sharing their story with us today. Um, and I want to congratulate them on their successful programs. Um, so if you would like to join us for our next webinar, that's going to be on July 9th, and it will be um, about the Imagination Awards. So thank you again for listening, and talk to you soon.